Welcome everyone to Science in Action. Uh, we want to welcome everyone on the call here. We host Science in Action every Tuesday, 4.30 to 5.30. Today, we are very lucky to have Kayla from Genentech uh, join us uh, for the hour to share with us her experience, uh, starting from Skyline and now working as a quality control associate at Genentech. So I'll hand it over to you, Kayla. Hello everyone, my name is Kayla and welcome to my Science in Action talk. So just a few years ago, I was in the same exact position as you guys, worrying about finals and wondering what I wanted to do with my life. Well, today I'm here to talk about my academic and my career path, and I hope that it inspires you and shows you that your ambitions are possible. So I'll be going over just a little bit about who I am, my experience at Skyline, some summer internships and research projects that I did, some key takeaways from Skyline and my internships, my transfer process and life after college. Um, and I'll be, going, I'll be giving a brief overview about how I got to where I am and the steps I took and some possible opportunities that are available to you guys. Hey, Kayla, so, this is Nick. Sorry, it's a little late. <laughs> Hi. So just a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in the Bay Area. Um, I have a huge passion for basketball. I played basketball from elementary school up until high school. And in high school, I played for my high school team as well as a club team. And that really taught me a lot of soft skills that I apply into my academic and my professional career, such as teamwork, communication, um, time management, and prioritization. And I also grew up with a huge family. So my dad, he has eight brothers and sisters. My mom has 11 brothers and sisters. So you can imagine how big of a family I have. Um, but it was always nice growing up with a big family just because I was always surrounded by a lot of support, whether that be um, in my academic life or my professional life, or just if I had any questions about like what I wanted to do. But also while growing up, I was surrounded by a bunch of healthcare professionals um, because my brother was always in and out of the hospital for health concerns. And also the Filipino culture of um, mostly going into healthcare as like a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer. So that's kind of what I heard all the time growing up that it was expected of me to become a nurse, a doctor or a lawyer. But I knew like deep down, I didn't wanna go into those things. So I kind of used um, Skyline as an opportunity for me to figure out what I wanted to major in and what I wanted to do because growing up, my professional careers were limited um, to become like a nurse or a doctor because that's what my family exposed me to. Um, so during my time at Skyline, I was involved with a couple clubs and organizations and I got the opportunity to present at Expanding Your Horizons. And if you guys ever have the opportunity to present at Expanding Your Horizons, I say take it because, um, so just a little, about, a little bit about Expanding Your Horizons. It's um, an event that Skyline hosts where we invite um, middle school and high school um, students to come and different clubs and organizations hold workshops, which kind of, um, which kind of helps the students get into different science fields and science career options. And personally, I enjoyed Expanding Your Horizons because it made me feel fulfilled and made me feel like I was getting back to the community because growing up, I never really saw a lot of women in STEM. And it's usually like portrayed that like a scientist is like, is a male. So just presenting and showing 
um, the younger generations that it's possible that you, to have a woman in STEM is something that I've found really fulfilling, fulfilling to do. Um, and honestly, I decided to join these clubs like Skylines Women Engineering, the Science and Research Club, and Mesa because there's a couple events that they hold and a lot of professors um, offer extra credit for going to, to those events. So that's what kind of sparked my interest in joining those clubs. But I ended up staying in those clubs because of the events that they hosted and, and just giving back to the community and feeling fulfilled by um, presenting and sharing my story with other people. And also these clubs gave me the opportunity to network and to meet new people. And I cannot stress this enough, but networking is super important because it helped me learn about opportunities that are available out there. And also meeting new people and meeting people in the industry can help create an opportunity for you that sometimes isn't available. For example, in the summer of 2016, I had a summer internship at UCSF and I didn't obtain this internship because it was posted online or I didn't hear about it from another person. I actually emailed over 20 different professors and PIs in the UCSF campus in labs that I thought were interesting. And I, I told them like, why I was interested in their labs, my research experience or my experience in the labs and what I can offer them and what they can offer me from this internship. And even though I heard back from only two out of 20, I still took advantage of the opportunity. I put myself out there and I created an opportunity for me to further my interest in science and to help me build upon my skills in the lab. And if I didn't take that risk and email over 20 different professors and PIs, then I wouldn't have obtained the skills that I learned from this internship or even, or even put myself out there. So in the summer of 2016, I took the internship with Coco Lab um, which is in the Mission Bay campus. And basically the lab studies neurodegenerative diseases and the behavioral effects that drugs have neurologically. And we studied how different chemical stimuli affect zebrafish and the neuronal and motor responses that they elect. And to visualize it, we use high throughput screening methods through like an observation chamber um, to visualize them and we created transgenic zebrafish. And these transgenic zebrafish, um, if you can look at the picture on the top right of the screen, the zebrafish contain specific chemical barcoding with them and they were also tagged with a fluorescent protein so we can visualize them on a fluorescent microscope. And part of my responsibility was to create these transgenic zebrafish. So we already had a community of zebrafish in our lab and we would tag them with fluorescent protein and these specific, specific chemical barcodes. And what I would do is I would crossbreed different zebrafish that had difficult, different chemical barcoding with them to create um, a certain breed of zebrafish that had a specific marker that we wanted to see. And then I would select the embryos that exhibited those chemical markers from looking at, a for, from looking at the fluorescent microscope. And then I would plate them on a 96 well plate, which you can see in the bottom right picture. And then we would load it with different doses of medicine and observe the effects in an observation chamber after an hour. And 
Well, Kayla, so that's really neat. So that's a 96 well plate that you put little zebra fish embryos inside of there. They're still still swimming around and doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty neat. And from this experience, um, I learned how to to create transgenic zebra fish and mate them. I learned how to use a fluorescent microscope, and I learned the dynamic of how a research lab is and how it works. And I think from this whole experience, the most important thing that I learned is to put myself out there and go after an opportunity that I saw it that I thought was really interesting for me and would help me build my professional career. So, and another research project that I did was with Dr. Cap in summer of 2018. And what we did here is um, I calibrated over hundreds of pipettes using a gamma metric system which is basically pipetting a certain amount and weighing it. And honestly, at first I didn't see what the point of it was because I thought my pipetting skills were okay, um, but I was wrong. <laughs> and from that whole calibrating exercise and experience, it helped me really improve my accuracy and my precision with the pipette, which is really important if you are looking to work in a lab that uses pipettes or if you are going to a career that uses pipettes because it's a really important skill to have. And another thing that I did was um, I grew and isolated and selected E. coli plasmids and we inserted them in different cultures of yeast by using a Bioneer kit. And we verified that the insertion work by reading it on gel electrophoresis and we determined the amount of DNA present by using a nanodrop. And from this experience, it helped me practice my microbio skills and my aseptic techniques and just taught me how to be more independent and taking criticism because at first I thought my pipetting skills were okay, but I learned and I improved. So my takeaways from community college that I thought would be helpful for if you guys are planning on transferring or just um, for your career is to establish your study habits early. So for me personally, I found that forming study have, forming study groups was what helped me understand the material and learn it better because you got to explain, you got to explain to someone else. And if you had any questions or you need a clarification, someone else can explain it to you. And it's also another way where you can practice your communication skills, which is really important um, in your career. Another takeaway that I learned from community college is to take advantage of office hours. I know from my experience, I never took advantage of office hours in community college, but once I transferred, I understood how important taking advantage of that opportunity is because it's not just, sorry, it's not just an opportunity for you to ask questions about the, the material or any assignments you're having, but it is also an opportunity for you to, to network and build that connection with your professor. And personally, I wish I took advantage of, of office hours because, um, and when I transferred, there was no time, there was no space to take advantage of the opportunity. And networking is important and because it shows that you are putting yourself out there. I'm sorry, can you guys see those emails <laughs> popping up? 
yeah, so office hours gave me the opportunity to build that network and that relationship with different professors. And I guarantee you, if you have any questions, whether it be on your material or career-wise or what you want to do professionally, that your professor would be willing to help you and answer any questions you have on that. Another takeaway is to be proactive and not to be scared to go for what you want. Just like how I took advantage of my opportunity at UCSF, if I didn't put myself out there and email over 20 different professors, then I wouldn't have got that opportunity to work with Zebrafish or to, to learn how a research lab works. So after community college, I still didn't know what direction I wanted to go in or what major I wanted to major in. So I applied to schools that I thought were interesting and in majors that I was also interested in. So I applied to CSU San Marcos and UC Davis under biotechnology. I applied to UC San Diego under pharmaceutical chemistry and I applied to San Francisco State and St. Mary's Cathedral under bio. And my top three schools were CSU San Marcos, UC Davis, and UC San Diego. So I love San Diego, which is why I applied there and I love the campus itself, but I didn't know if I wanted to, to major in pharmaceutical chemistry because the career paths were, were limited to becoming a pharmacist or working in industry to produce medicine and I didn't know if I wanted to go down that path yet which is why I kind of leaned in the direction of biotechnology because the career options with biotechnology it's unlimited so I, um, that led me to choose between CSU San Marcos and UC Davis and unfortunately I did not get accepted into CSU San Marcos but that's fine and I went to UC Davis So I transferred to UC Davis in 2017 and the transition from UC Davis to the transition to UC Davis was a huge adjustment for me because the class sizes were so much bigger than community. They can range from 20 people in a discussion class up to 300 in a lecture class. So that made it hard for me to to meet new people and to form study groups. And as an incoming transfer, everyone had their study groups and group of friends already. So I had a hiccup in, in meeting new people. And another problem that I faced was the switch to a quarter system. The switch from semester to quarter system is not a joke <laughs> because everything felt really fast paced and I had an exam like every other week and every week you had a quiz. Um, also just the, just trying to adapt to different professors teaching styles in a shorter amount of time was something I found difficult with. And just lifestyle wise, I had to adjust to living in a totally different community. So in the Bay Area, everything is fast paced, but in Davis, everything is slower and it's it's more of like a, a tight knit family like community. And I had to adjust to that. And even though I wasn't far away from home, I had to adjust to living on my own and with other people who have different backgrounds than me. And it kind of taught me how to be independent and not to be scared to ask for help. But the transfer to UC Davis really helped further my interest in science. There is one class in particular that I took called um, Animal Genetics 101. And it was basically an animal genetics course where we practice our molecular biotechniques. 
And in this class, we had a huge project where we wanted to create a population of polled cattle by deleting a polled, um, a polled gene from their genome. And, <laughs> and the polled gene is a dominant trait, which is found in cattle and a deletion of it would create cattle without horns, which makes it easier for farmers to handle and transport them. So what we did in this class is we produced the clone insert of the polled gene and used bacterial transformation to insert it into a plasmid. And then we determined appropriate guide RNAs that work best for targeting CRISPR-Cas9 to produce, to, sorry, we work at best at targeting CRISPR-Cas9 to the polled locus to cause that deletion. And while I was at Davis, I also took advantage of the opportunity to study abroad. And if you guys have the chance to, I say take it because it is worth the experience. And if you think about it, you're fulfilling your graduation requirements in a whole nother country while also experiencing and embracing a whole nother culture. And I know that price can be a huge concern and part of the reason why people do not take that opportunity to study abroad. But there's a lot of resources out there to help you with that. Um, in UC Davis specifically, they have certain scholarships geared to certain study abroad programs. So only the people who are going to those study abroad programs can apply to those scholarships and you are more likely to get those scholarships for it. And studying abroad is possible if you look at the resources that are available to you and if you take advantage of them. So my study abroad was in Poland and we studied equine welfare and management, which is basically, which basically we studied horses. So our first two days we were at our university um, and we had class basically looking at different breeds of horses, what we should look for in a healthy horse in a, a stable that a horse is being taken care of well, um, what in certain foods these horses eat and just things to look out for in a healthy horse. And then the rest of the time, we went to different facilities and ranches and open fields to look at the horses and their body composition. So I studied at, um, in Krakow and Warsaw. So the first three pictures on the left side of the screen are from, from Krakow, from the downtown of Krakow and the downtown city of Krakow. Yeah. And then we would go to open fields and facilities. So one of the examples is the picture on the right where I'm posing next to the horse. And when we went to these different facilities, we would check their, their body, their hooves, their ears, their eyes, their tails. And then we would give them a score based on the requirement in Poland and also our requirement in the USA. And then we would also look at the stables and their facilities just to look at if they had water available to them, food, shade, and if they had like housing. Because all of that ties into the management and welfare of the horse. And on our downtime, we explored Poland. So we went to a bunch of restaurants, tried Polish food. We went um, hiking to see horses. We went on some bike rides in the woods to see horses in open fields. And then we also went to touristy places like, like the salt mines. We went to a bunch of castles, cathedrals, and we even went to Auschwitz concentration camp. 
And my studying abroad experience was amazing. And if you guys have the opportunity to do it, I say go for it because it's something that no one can take away from you. Also, um, just from my talk, from speaking with different hiring managers, um, they say that they look for people who study abroad because it shows that they are taking a risk and taking advantage of the opportunity of being in another country and experiencing that culture. So as my spring quarter was coming to an end, I didn't know if I wanted to go to work, if I wanted to pursue my master's or if I wanted to travel. But the one thing that I did do is I created a LinkedIn account and I updated um, my work experience, my volunteer experience, everything like that on there. And the most important thing that I did was I changed my status to currently searching for jobs because that lets the recruiters or companies know that you are looking for a job. And sometimes they will come out to you and reach out to you and say, oh, we have this opportunity available. Do you wanna take advantage of it or do you want more information on it? So within my last two weeks of undergrad, I was getting contacted about a bunch of different jobs. So I thought, why not take advantage of it and see what the world has to offer me? And lucky enough, I was able to land a contract job at Genentech. So a week after I crossed stage and graduated, I started working at Genentech as a quality control associate. And the department that I work for is Biological Technologies or BT. And we fall under PTDU, which stands for Pharma Technical Development in the USA. And we fall under the subgroup ADQC, which stands for Analytical Development and Quality Control. So in BT, we fall under Pharma Technical Operations and we are responsible for the development, optimization, validation, transfer, and technical support of biological methods used for quality control in clinical and commercial products. We also support stability testing and lot release testing of these clinical products and potency testing for process development and product characterization. I know I said a lot of big words <laughs> that some of you guys might not understand what they all mean right now, but basically we turn a molecule into medicine and we have this molecule from its preclinical stages where it is being tested and developed up until it is ready for commercialization and is ready to be sent out to the patient. And as a quality control associate, my responsibilities are to perform routine maintenance of GMP labs, which stands for good manufacturing practice, just to ensure the compliance with GMP and safety regulations, since we do work in a BSL-2 environment. I also support cell culturing to provide analysts with cells that they need to test these molecules on. And I am also currently working with an outreach group in my department to help spread awareness about my group and advertise available opportunities we have at Genentech. And if you guys are interested in this opportunity, I'd be glad to share it with you after these slides. Um, so my next step is to further my education and to study to be a clinical laboratory scientist. So I am currently applying to CLS programs and I hope to hear back from them and start school next fall. And um, just a little bit about CLS. Um, how many of you guys ever had to take a swab or get a sample of your blood or had to pee in a cup? Basically, I would receive those samples and I would perform tests on them to help 
um, doctors come up with a diagnosis for you. And with CLS, I want to go towards um, crime scene investigation or, or work in fertility clinics. Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? Well, Kayla, how about if I ask a few little questions and then that will kind of get the ball rolling with a lot of other people okay. in there. And so, um, so what does your family think of this, right? Because you come from a big Filipino family and they want you to be a nurse or a doctor. Um, and, and while you are going into healthcare, you're not going into that part. So did you, was it a difficult conversation to have with your family or was it pretty easy? What happened? Um, it's still a difficult conversation, a difficult topic right now, because um, I am currently applying to schools and I would like constantly hear from them. Oh, like if you were a nurse, you wouldn't have to go back to school. You would already have your career. You wouldn't have to be worrying about this. But I just keep reminding them like that's something that that's something that I don't want to do. I don't want to be a nurse. I don't find that interesting or fulfilling for me. I want to be in the labs helping doctors come up, come up with diagnosis for patients. Um, but I feel like they're slowly coming around the idea because of um, this whole thing with the pandemic too. Um, because I just kind of explained to them what a CLS does and how I would be helping if I was currently a CLS, how I would be helping during this pandemic. Yeah, you're definitely needed right now. They yeah. are they are definitely needed. Um, so here's some questions uh, that were on the chat. Knowing how often you experience rejection or doors being closed along your journey and how you overcame these situations or uh, is bumping up and what you did to make the opportunities accessible to you. So how, and, you know, how did you overcome these situations and what did you do to make these opportunities accessible to you? Um, so I just kind of had that, that mindset that if I didn't put myself out there, then I wouldn't have got the opportunity to do it. Um, just like my summer internship at UCSF, if I didn't put myself out there to reach out to different professors in labs that I thought I was interested in and would help me in my academic and my career path, then what would I be doing? Like, I, I wouldn't have anything to, to lose other than someone saying no. But that's so scary. It's so incredibly scary. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, how do you, you, you know, you say, it and that's just what you do. And you got rejected yeah. 20, 18 times, but two times they were good. And, you know, how do you, you, you just did the first phone and it got easier after you did oh, no. the first call or what? I just, I just kept trying and I, I tried to create an opportunity for me. So even if, I got an answer no from someone. I kept trying. I kept I kept practicing skills that I thought would be useful and would make me more appealing to to other professors or other other companies. So I just kept practicing in skills that I kept practicing skills that is needed for that industry and needed for something that I wanted to do. So instead of hearing no from someone and not doing any, anything about it and just being scared and saying like, oh, someone said no, so I'm going to stop trying. I didn't do that. I kept trying and I tried to see if there was any opportunity available for me out there. And it didn't have to be in something that like I 100% wanted to do as long as I got... I put myself out there and started to do something in, in the field. Um, that's how I kind of got all these opportunities coming to me. Because without my experience at UCSF, then 
I wouldn't have any, I wouldn't have experience working in a lab or, or understanding how, how people like communicate or how to use a fluorescent microscope or things like that, that applied to, to my career right now. Okay. Um, here's one uh, from Alicia. Uh, what was your most memorable experience during your uh, 2018 summer internship at UCSF? I think just Pat or this 2016 at UCSF? Probably 2016 yeah. at UCSF. Okay. Um, my most memorable experience there was kind of just like starting out there like my first couple of days because everything was new and interesting to me and um, just learning about how to to mate zebrafish, how to create transgenic zebrafish and how, how to use all these equipment that I've never seen before um, kind of made that experience memorable for me. Uh, so what you have related is, this is from Madeline, one of our students. Uh, what you have related is very interesting. Could you let us know what keeps you motivated? So what keeps me motivated, um, as cliche as this might sound, but my younger cousins. Um, because at first, they would always hear from their family as well, like, oh, become a nurse, become a doctor. So just seeing me take a different career path that's also in science um kind of just like inspires them like oh we have a bunch of professional careers out there and i just don't have to become a nurse or i don't have to become a doctor so it's kind of motivating for me to see that i have my cousins who are are kind of like supporting me and are cheering cheering me on into what i want to do and and just the thought that like I inspire them kind of motivates me to keep going. Okay. Uh, here's from, from Gabriella. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences. When did, uh, when you did your research with zebrafish, how did you insert the drugs injection via food? Okay. Um, so we inserted it through an injection. Unfortunately, I couldn't, insert or I couldn't do the injection. We had a graduate student who kind of focuses his studies with that. Um, so he inserted it through an through injection. So it's hard to inject a zebra fish. Yeah. And if I did it, then I would have to go through a bunch of trainings for it. And we didn't have the time for that. So you have to do the animal care facilities, the IRB, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. so that the, the fish are treated humanely and kind of everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. But not so with the horses. You were able to do a bunch of stuff with the horses? Or that was uh, in Poland? Oh, so in Poland, um, with the horses, all we did is we just observed the horses and just pet them and went horseback riding. <laughs> That's all we did. <laughs> Um, so here, it's, I have a few friends who also participated in study abroad programs, and they all said their experience was life changing. And would you say your trip and studies changed your life in terms of your career and studies? Definitely. So it changed. It changed my studies um, because I just had the opportunity to to see how like the Polish students were learning and compared it to how our school system is in the United States. So there was a huge difference in that. And it was kind of like a culture shock for me for, for being in Poland as well. So it kind of opened my eyes to see like, hey, um, certain things that are acceptable in the United States isn't like acceptable or isn't what's the word isn't okay in Poland and it was just it was just a whole different culture and I kind of 
had to adjust with that in the beginning because um, our city abroad group, we had a bunch of different people. So um, a bunch, yeah, so a bunch of different people and we all didn't have the same appearance or look the same. So a lot of people in Poland would just stare at us and be like, oh, but why are they all hanging out together? Like, they don't seem like a group who would fit or like, what are they doing in here? So that was also something that kind of opened my eyes to. Okay, um, from another student, uh, what kind of jobs are available for a person with basic science degree at Genentech? Um, I actually have another PowerPoint for that for you guys who are interested that I can go over. Um, I'm interested. Right now? Okay. Or do we have any other questions about my slides before I jump into okay. Genentech? <laughs> uh, well, the last one, which schools are you planning on applying to become a CLS? And, and maybe, you know, you're doing science right now. What, mm -hmm. what advantage is the CLS going to give you? And right, it's going to be another two years and another $40,000. I mean, yeah. So the CLS programs that I'm currently applying to are 12 month programs. Um, and I am applying to Oregon Tech, um, Texas Tech University, um, Cal State Long Beach, and UC Davis again, and also UC San Diego. Um, what was the other part to the question? Um, so what advantage would the CLS give you over the job? It seems like you have a pretty neat job right now. What advantage would that, that CLS give you that you couldn't do and just work at right now? So um, I have an interest in CLS because like I said, I, I like being in the forefront helping doctors um, come up with a diagnosis for patients. Um, whereas what I'm doing right now, we are kind of in the industry field and we are producing um, certain medicine to help patients, which is kind of the same thing. But I, I want to be in the labs um, doing data analysis on patient samples. And I think that's the difference that I want to do. I want to work with people samples and help the doctors call the diagnosis. So the CLS Whereas, is kind of like a prof, more of a professional degree yeah. that will allow you to do more of the thinking than just mm -hmm. the hands-on. Yeah. You don't mind me asking about how much is that a year for Oregon State or for Oregon Tech or Texas Tech? How much is that? That's out of state. Um, so for Oregon Tech or for Oregon Tech, it is around 25 to 30 for the 12 months. And then Texas Tech, um, it's it's in the 20s. And then if I do get into UC Davis, um, I don't have to pay anything for the program. Wow. And then in San Diego, it comes out to be like 40. 50 because it is in California as well. Yeah. And the schools in California are more competitive. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what you have on, on Genentech. I, I'd love to see that. Okay. I think everyone else is excited. Let's see some show. Okay. <laughs> looks being excited. Um, okay. Yeah. And also I wanted to give this talk because um, when I was in community college or like in high school, I never really heard that much about this company or how to apply to different jobs or, or see these jobs posted. So I kind of created an outreach group in my department to help spread awareness about this and to hopefully, hopefully help you guys think about 
these opportunities that are available to you guys. So with Genentech, we hire into five major areas, which is research and early development, product development, pharma technical operations, which is the department I'm in, commercial, medical, and government affairs, and corporate groups. Um, I can provide you guys more information with pharmacotechnical operations since I am in that department. But with the other ones, um, if you guys are interested in those, I can help find more information about that and give that to you. So Genentech currently offers internships and full-time rotational programs. Internships are usually for students who are pursuing their bachelor's or already have their bachelor's. And it, it's from three months to six months, whereas the full-time rotational programs are for students who have a bachelor's or a master's already. And it is usually for two years long. And I'll go into d detail about both of them. So like I said, internships are usually three to six months long. And basically the scope of the project is what the hiring coach or tech, the hiring manager or a technical coach wants to do. So it's kind of like a project that they have in mind, but they don't have the time to do right now. So they have an intern come in to help with it. And in BT, um, it's usually to help develop a, a new cell bank or to help develop an assay to help with a multiple molecule project. And we also have interns help in writing technical SOPs, which stands for standard operating procedures. And that's basically like instructions on how to do an experiment or how to use certain equipment. And that is super important in a quality control environment because you wanna ensure that we are GMP compliant. And if we are not GMP compliant, then we get in trouble with the FDA and with certain companies that um, kind of watches over us and make sure that we're following the rules. And basically an intern um, operates kind of like a full-time employee at Genentech, except you have a lot of supervision. Um, usually the first couple of weeks you go through a bunch of trainings just so you can work with certain equipment and you can be in the lab since we do work in a BSL2 environment. And then usually a day-to-day -day is you spend your first 15 minutes talking to your hiring manager or technical coach, um, talking about what you want to kind of accomplish in the day. And then you would go back to your desk, check your calendar, check emails, kind of plan out what you want to do for the day and see if you have any important meetings or conferences that you have to attend because those randomly pop up every single day and take up a bunch of your time. And then for the rest of the time, you are in either at your computer um, trying to create data or you are in the labs trying to produce, um, produce data. And then after you produce that data, you would go back to to your desk and kind of go over what you accomplished through the day. Um, talk to your hiring manager about certain obstacles you had or what was helpful or, or what you accomplished. And then you would just keep create or keep performing different experiments to get um, to help the hiring manager with their project. And, and these internships are usually offered in the summer. So at the end of your internship, um, there's kind of a poster symposium where you create a poster and talk about what you did in your project and a bunch of different departments um, can stop by your poster and read it and see um, what you accomplished. Um, and then we also have rotational programs. Um, and there is a total of six full-time rotational programs currently available at Genentech. 
Um, I am going to talk about PDRP, which stands for Process Development Rotational Program, because that is what um, is currently offered for my department. And even though you guys might not be able to apply to this program right now, since it requires a bachelor's or a master's, um, I'm presenting this just so you guys can have this idea in your mind after you graduate and if this is something that you're interested in. So PDRP, um, Process Development Rotational Program, it is for two years long and it is basically um, like an internship, but instead of um, sticking with one department, you get to go to a bunch of these different departments here. So you are in four different rotational programs and each program goes up to six months long. And usually the scope of your project is on a bigger scale because you are taking what you learn from one department and applying it to the next. So after your two years, you kind of tie in what you learned from all the departments and tie that into your project at the end. And even though, like I said, this might not apply to you guys right now, I just wanted to present this so you guys can keep this in the back of your mind and have this opportunity available to you. And this is um, the application process. So usually these positions are posted from October to February on our website. And then in December to April, you will be contacted by a hiring manager um, to have interviews if you do get selected. And then in March, the applications close and you start your internship or PDRP program in April and have that in the summer. And this is how you can apply. So you would go on gene.com slash careers and then you would filter the search um, to interns and postdocs. And then from there, you can see any of the, of the different um, opportunities available on there. And even though you might not find an opportunity that um, you find interesting right now, um, this is what I recommend you guys do. You guys create your profile on the websites, um, upload your resume on that, and also turn on job notifications because they post um, different internships and jobs every couple of days on there. And even though you're not, even though you don't find a position that is currently open right now, having the job notifications on can like alert you of certain um, opportunities that open up when they become available. And also creating a profile on here is super helpful because it shows the Genentech talent acquisition team that you are currently looking at Genentech and interested in certain, um, certain jobs or internships there so they can see that you are actively looking. And um, you can contact me for any questions you have about Genentech, about life, about your transfer process, or about any of the, the research opportunities that I talked about. Um, but I also have um, a coworker in my department who is willing to help you with resumes or questions about the company, or he can also help you with interview questions or like the interview process at Genentech. So his name is Peter Day and he is a technical developmental um, senior scientist at Genentech. And he is also um, helping me with this outreach program in my group. So if I got any, if I tried to get a point across from all my, from my PowerPoint slides, it's to take advantage of these opportunities because I wish I had someone who talked to me about these opportunities and kind of helped me figure out how to apply to them and just the company itself. So feel free to contact me or Peter Day about any, any of these questions because we would love to help you. 
So thank you, and I hope to see you guys actually in tech. I'm going to keep this slide up if you guys want to copy down the emails or anything. Okay. Kayla, I need to get going to another class that came up kind of all of a sudden. Yeah. So, but I, I will talk to you a little bit later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming back and talking to us. Thank and, you. Uh, you know, again, our, our students, you need to take these opportunities and, and talk to her. So thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions or I can provide more information on anything? Uh, so maybe I'll double back to a couple of the questions um, that were posted earlier in the chat and just give yeah. some folks some time. But um, let's see, one of the earlier questions that we see uh, from Megan, what's your favorite part about your job at Genentech? Um, so my favorite part about Genentech, I would say is um, just like the whole experience because it is something, because it is kind of like my first big girl job from graduating um, college. So just seeing how to like step into like adulthood and kind of learning more about the company. Um, so I found that working for this company is fulfilling because like I said, we actually are working to help patients. And that's something that I want to do in my career is to help patients. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm going to leave the opportunity for any other participants to post uh, one more question in the chat, maybe. Um, but otherwise, I'll double back to another one that we had earlier. So. Um, I know we just went over it in the slides, but maybe uh, addressing the question a little bit more explicitly from Jocelyn, what kind of jobs are available for a person with a basic science degree uh, at Genetech? At Genetech. Yeah. Um, I kind of, that's kind of like a hard question to ask because, or are you currently asking for what is available and open currently or just in general? Uh, let's keep the question general, unless we okay. get a specification <laughs> from another student. So with the general bio degree, there are so many options to go into with Genentech. Um, so I want to say that it doesn't have to do with what you obtain a, deg a degree in. It's more so with what you take out of that degree and the experiences you took from it. So um, it's kind of how you spin your certain experience and talk about it. So at Genentech, you can honestly go into anything that you find interesting with bio. So we have, um, we have clinical laboratory scientists on the site. We have people who work in automation to help create like different equipment to help make our lives easier. Um, or we have people who work in cell culture and just do cell culture. We have people who, who work with um, stability samples and kind of just aliquot samples and that's all they do, and, and they ship it out to whichever department needs it. Um, and we have, we just have a bunch of different options, like a bunch of available jobs there that you can do with bio for anything. Yeah, maybe following up on your uh, earlier advice in the presentation, just kind of reach out, network, get connected, yeah. and just ask around. You'll, you know, you'll be surprised in what you learn um, from that outreach. But I also want to be mindful of the time. We did reach the 5.30 mark yeah. here. Um, I want to thank you again uh, for taking the time to spend uh, with us in Science in Action. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go ahead and close out the recording by thanking all of the participants for being on the call. And for those of you guys are, that are watching on YouTube, we have one final uh, Science in Action left for the fall 2020 semester. So hopefully see you uh, all on the call. Kayla, thank you again.
uh, for taking the Thank time uh, this afternoon, evening to spend with us and sharing yeah. uh, your educational journey and your insights and the opportunities over at Genentech. Thank you guys for your time. <laughs>